Good to see some visitors with us again this morning. Glad you found your way here. I'm glad the rest of you found your way here as well. I remember uh, when I first started working with the congregation in Wyoming, uh, one of the sisters there told me that she had asked the previous preacher, how come you're always extending the invitation? Do you believe that we're basically a bunch of sinners? <laughs> I had to call him about that. He, re <laughs> he remembered it and uh, commented a few things. She had come from a rather liberal congregation. A lot of congregations like that, if they do extend the invitation, it's, it's not a lot. You don't want to run anybody off. But why do we do that? Why do we extend the invitation at the end of the sermon? Is it a tradition? Well, in some ways, I guess it is. But it's probably done more for convenience than anything else. At the end of the sermon, people's minds are focused upon that lesson, hopefully. And it's a, an opportune time to extend the invitation to someone who might want to obey the gospel that day. Or possibly they want to confess sin in their life. Or they will also ask the prayers of the church on health reasons or some other matters. No matter what some people may think, preachers are not omniscient. They do not know everything. They don't know whatever everyone's doing at all times or thinking. So what if we quit? Well, if, if we did this Sunday, I might be told to quit too. But happen chance, what if? After the end of the sermon, I just go sit down. Brother Brantley gets up here and he leads us in a closing prayer. What if someone did want to obey the gospel that day or that moment? What if someone needed to repent of sin in their life? What would they do? Would they be confused? Would they not come forward? Probably so, they probably wouldn't. So that's the big reason we do this. It may, makes things less awkward for the individuals. And as it states, and we are to do today, we're to do things decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. And when it comes to confession, we understand that it depends upon the situation. So this morning's first point is the confession of the non-Christian. Now that word confess comes from a Greek word hamogaleo. You say it real quick so everybody thinks you know how you pronounce it. That's all that is. What that word means according to Vine's Bible Dictionary is to speak the same thing. It's to admit something, to acknowledge it as true, to uh, declare it, which is exactly what the Father did when Jesus was baptized. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, he states, Matthew 3, 17, and then he states it again in Matthew 17, 5, at the Mount of Transfiguration. Likewise, we declare we admit we speak the same thing when we declare our belief that Jesus is the Son of God. We often uh, bring up the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, as a, a great example, and it is, who confessed to Philip that he believed that Jesus he is the Son of God, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. He gave that good confession to Philip. And every one of us who have done that, 
we still remember that moment in our lives. Truly a wonderful blessing to be able to confess our belief that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God, and that we believe in that. So many people down through the ages gave their life in confessing that. And Matthew 10, verse 32, Jesus stated, Whosoever, that's anybody, whoever it is, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32. The importance of confessing him. A.T. Robertson, in his commentary on this passage, made this point, and I thought it was a good point. He states this is indicating a sense of unity with Christ and of Christ with the man, or woman for that matter, who takes the open stand for him. There is a sense of unity that's starting to take place between the individual who confesses him and Jesus has uni unity with that individual, and that individual will have unity with him. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. These are two verses that we're very familiar with. A lot of times we will bring these uh, passages up in extending the invitation. Beginning in verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Made unto salvation. We understand that just confession alone will not save our soul. That is a part in God's plan of salvation, the gospel plan of salvation. We know that there's that one more step that someone has to make, and that is baptism for the remission of sins. This is a confession, however, not of sin, but of faith. Peter also gave that good confession. Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God, Matthew 16, verse 16. So that is a confession of faith that the person who's not a Christian needs to make. Not just make, they need to believe it. They need to be sincere in that. But then there's another confession that we're probably recognized more than others, and that's the confession of sin. This is the confession that the Christian sometimes makes. For all have sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And we know what sin is because the Bible tells us. Sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. But what exactly is a definition of sin according to the scriptures? Just that word. It's missing the mark. But what mark? And who set that mark? Well, God made that mark. And he set it. So we can know what sin is. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown defined it this way. It's God's will being that mark to ever be aimed at. If we miss that mark, then of course we sin. Even though someone's repented of their sins, they've been forgiven of their sins, those sins have been washed away in that act of baptism, Acts 2.38. They receive that remission of sins, and even though they are continuing to walk in the light as, as he is in the light, 1 John 1.7, that doesn't mean that someone can't stumble. Galatians 6.9. No, excuse me, Galatians 6.1. Because they can we can still sin. I have known individuals uh, who seemingly thought that they couldn't sin. 
and they couldn't make mistakes. Well, that's not what the scriptures tells us. 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is what? The truth is not in us. That's what that states. So the remedy for that, of course, is confession of sin. Sometimes we refer to it as that second law of pardon. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All. Every bit. If we're willing to confess that sin. To repent of that sin. I'll give you a good example of that. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Luke 15, 21. That's a good example. Now this is in the parable of the prodigal son. But this is what he said to his father when he returned to him from that far country, living a riotous lifestyle. And of course we understand in the parable, the father represented our heavenly father. But he was sincere as far as that confession of sin was. Often we have heard there are two kinds of sin. There's the sin of commission, then there's the sin of omission. And under those two categories there are a bunch of others, types. The sin of commission, you think of the word committing. Another way you could phrase it is, these are the thou shalt nots found in the scriptures. We understand what that is. Here is the command of God that this is something that you cannot do. And sometimes we still do it anyway. A good example of that is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. But of a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This was God speaking to Adam and Eve. Did they understand that? They understood it. What did they do? They broke it. It's one of those thou shalt nots. They didn't heed God's advice, his order, his command. And they sinned because of that. They needed to have the attitude, and we need to have the attitude today, the attitude of, of Joseph, who was being tempted by Potiphar's wife, but would not give in. He wasn't going to give in. As he states, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God, Genesis 39, 9? How can I commit this sin? This great wickedness, and it would have been great wickedness. But he realized that that sin and all sin is against God. And every sin that we commit in one way or another is against God. So he wasn't going to give in. He literally fled useful lusts. Ran out of his own clothes. Then there's the sin of omission. You could label this the, the thou shouts. One gospel preacher in preparing for this sermon stated he, he was afraid that a lot of brethren understand the thou shalt nots and, and not giving in to that sin, but the thou shouts, they just kind of let slide by. It seemingly to them is not as important, but it is. This is the sin of omitting. This is leaving things undone that we should have done. Jesus uh, speaks of this. Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 25, verses 42 and 43. There's all kinds of sin that can be involved in this. There's the sin of not being part of the work of a local congregation. We know we're supposed to do this, but we are leaving it undone. 
There is also the sin of not trying to reach out to the lost that's all around us. We know that this is also a command that we as Christians are to be involved in. It's left undone. One of the more noticeable sins is the sin of not attending the services as we should. I'm not talking about people who are sick. They're ill. They can't respond. Someone who has got the flu or COVID, as Sister Pam did. I love Sister Bush, but I didn't want to see her when she was sick like that. That might be a sin itself, spreading that disease. We understand that. We should understand that. Sometimes we may have to work. I used to have to work Wednesday nights for a while. Put food on the table. That's not a sin in itself either. We should try to look for a job where we don't have to miss services. And sometimes emergencies come up at the last second. But we're talking about a, a brother or sister in Christ who knows that we are commanded to attend on the first day of the week to partake of the fruit of the vine and all acts of worship. And they just choose not to. They don't want to. Rather do something else. That's the sin that we're talking about. As James put it in James 4, 17, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Plain and simple. That's impossible not to understand. Now I'd like to mention a few misconceptions as far as confessing of sins. And I'm just going to mention a few because there's more that we could talk about. There is a belief in today's society and this has been prevalent for a number of decades that someone can trespass against us, sin against us, and that we can, we can actually forgive them of that sin and they never did repent of it. They never came to us. You may have heard of people who believe this. Again, we'll go back to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our God can do that then. But for someone to say, and think of it this way, let's say Michael. No, I won't use Michael. He's an elder. Let's say Denise. No, Someone sins against us and they never ask us to be forgiven of that. They never come and say, I'm sorry I said this or I did that. Please forgive me. But I can forgive them like nothing ever happened. Am I better than God is? Am I greater than he is? Am I more forgiving than he is? We kind of touched on this in Bible class. Not even close. Can't do that. Remember that repentance comes prior to forgiveness. That's how it works out, whether we like it or not. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. I'd like for us to listen to a confession that someone made a number of years ago, many years ago. And once I start reading these passages, you'll know who I'm talking about. And listen to these words and, and think to yourselves, did this individual believe this current heresy? Okay, starts off. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. 
For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before thee. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3. That's the sin of David. He was confessing to God the sin of Bathsheba, committing that fornication, that adultery, and then having her husband Uriah the Hittite murdered. So he's confessing that. He's very sincere. He realized that he had to ask for forgiveness. He had to confess that sin to be forgiven of that. And that's still that way. Sometimes you even have brethren who believe this. Hard to believe. I remember that a congregation in Aurora, and in a Bible class, this was around 1996, we were discussing this topic in Bible class, the importance of sin, repentance, confession, being forgiven. And we had a visitor that one morning who basically states, even if someone does sin against me, I can forgive them of their sins even if they do not repent. And there was a mean old man sitting right next to me. His name was Dad. And he spoke up. No one else had spoken up. He spoke up. That is not according to the scriptures and stated what the scriptures teach. And then other people started speaking up. I wonder if he hadn't, maybe nobody would have. And once this individual was caught in that, he said, well, that's, that's not really what I meant. That is what he meant. Now, I understand that we can, someone commits a sin against us, we can still treat them as a brother, not as an enemy. That's what Paul wrote. 2 Thessalonians 3.15. However, there's still on sin on their record. They still haven't repented of it. I cannot forgive them of that sin until they do. If God cannot forgive us of a sin until we repent of it and confess that sin, how can a mere mortal do that? Can't happen. Won't happen. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault, now watch this, between thee and him alone. Then say the whole congregation, between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Matthew 18, 50. Of course, that whole chapter has been taken out of context to mean something that it doesn't. Someone uh, publicly preaches a sermon that is not according to the truth. Well, you have to go to that individual personally first. Doesn't say that. Another uh, misconception. I cannot pray for someone who's living in sin. Maybe they've turned their backs upon God completely like my brother. I cannot pray to God that God will forgive him of his sin and he's not willing to do what it takes to be forgiven of that sin. Sometimes I think we think we can do that. It's like the old story of the alcoholic. We can encourage this person to quit drinking. But guess what? Until he wants to do that, he will not stop drinking. That's a proven fact. Now I can pray that someone will repent, that they will come to the Lord, that they will make things right. And we should. But it's still up to that sinner to repent, confess that sin, whatever that sin is. Another misconception. When we repent, whether it's personal or public, we need to be genuine about it. We need to be sincere. Have you ever heard someone, and generally it's a public official, a politician. You remember what the word politic stands for. Poly is plural and a tick is a blood-sucking parasite. 
But that's a side point, back to the sermon. They're always famous for saying, if I offended anyone with what I said, or if I have hurt anyone's feelings with what I said or what I did, I hope you can forgive me. Notice the key word there is if, which is then left up to subjection. This is not in a, a sincere form of repentance. They're trying to avoid it. They're making excuses. They're trying to save face, but it's not sincere. Back to the prodigal son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. That was genuine. That was sincere. He wasn't trying to make any excuses whatsoever for his sin. Like David, his sin was ever before him as well. And he had all the time in the world when he's walking back home to get those things straight. And he did. Another misconception. This is from James 5.16. Confess your faults one to another. That's key. And pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 again. This does not teach the doctrine of the Catholicism. That what we are to do when we sin is we are to go to a holier person like a Catholic priest. And excuse my French, but they ain't holier to begin with. But we are to go to that individual, we are to confess our sin, and then that individual can forgive us. By the way, what does it say? We are to confess these sins one to another. This is mutual. This is reciprocal. But under that Catholic doctrine, they don't confess to the person who confessed to them. And why they would ever go to that passage is, is really beyond me, because the passage itself refutes, refutes it. We already have a mediator between ourselves and our Father in heaven. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Would you rather have a Catholic priest or Jesus the Christ as your mediator? It's pretty simple. The last point, to whom does a Christian confess to? Or how should they confess? I understand I am covering a sermon and a topic that we've heard a number of times. You hear it in one form or another pretty much every invitation. But something that was uh, pointed out to us that sometimes we may overlook. There's a camera back there. These sermons are going over the internet. Brother Hatcher brought up those individuals that heard one of Ali's sermons. And by the way, if you weren't here, you couldn't be here. You really missed out, but you can catch up on them. They're there. So sometimes people are listening who are not Christians whatsoever. And they don't know what this teaches. They don't know the importance of confession of sins. And there are some Christians who sometimes are confused by it. Any sin, unrepented of, puts a barrier between us and our God. It truly does. A number of passages that point that out. Psalm 68, 18. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. Another passage we can look at is Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Our iniquities have separated us between us and our God. He won't hear us either. So what are we to do? Again, go back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, we know that he is faithful 
He is just to forgive us of those sins, whatever those sins are. We confess those sins. The old saying that as public as a sin is, that is how public you make it, is, is still true. We understand that if a sin is private in nature, we don't have to declare it to everyone. We shouldn't declare it to everyone. Just go to our God in prayer and ask him to forgive us of that sin. And by the way, asking forgiveness of a sin that we committed also means that we're going to stop committing that sin. If we're truly honest. Personal sin. Committing a sin against someone else, whether it's a brother or sister in Christ, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a co-worker. And if it is a brother or sister in Christ, we are to go to them and do it immediately, as quickly as we can, Matthew 5, 23, 24. Brother G.K. Wallace said, private wrong should be corrected privately. And yet, sometimes brethren will go to their best friends in the congregation and they'll say, well, guess what so-and-so said to me, or guess what they did to me. Before you know it, the whole congregation knows about it. That's a sin. That's not how you would handle that situation. We go to that person and we ask them to forgive us. Could it be possible that the person didn't realize that they sinned against us? It could be. What should we do? Well, we just read it, Matthew 18, 15. We go to them. It is between thee and him alone. And then there's the last one. We refer to it as a public sin, and this covers a number of kinds of sins. Is it possible that we could go to every single member who knows that we sinned and ask them to forgive us? We could do it that way. It makes more sense just to public confess that sin, whether someone comes forward, whether someone gives a, a note to myself or one of the elders, and that is read. And then we pray for that individual, and that individual is forgiven of their sins. That's a little bit more logical, I guess, if you could phrase it that way. You get arrested for a DUI coming home one night, and it gets into the paper, guess what? That's going to be a public sin. Not only the community, but the church where you attend, they'll know it as well. That's a sin that needs to be publicly confessed. You get caught committing fornication. That's a public sin. Again, not attending services as we could and should, that's also a public sin. By the way, we need to understand that confession of sin is not some kind of punishment. It really isn't. It's to keep us from punishment. When we have faithful brethren praying for us. And by the way, we also set the right example. And we've all made sin, uh, confession of sins like that. Confess means to speak the same thing, is to admit, is to declare. Confession that we believe in Jesus is and as the Son of God, that's a confession of faith. A confession of sin is the sin that a brother or sister in Christ makes, that they will be forgiven of that sin as well. And that confession of, of faith is one that we will never forget. There may be someone here this morning who would like to confess that they do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They believe in him. They believe in his word, the gospel. They're ready to repent of sin in their life that change of mind that leads to a change of lifestyle, to confess his name before others, and to be baptized for the remission of all the sins they ever committed in their life. 
If someone needs to repent of sin publicly, we pray that you will do that as well. And we will pray for you, and you will be forgiven. And sometimes someone needs to just come forward and ask prayers of the church on their behalf for something that's going, that they need to be strengthened. If we can help you in any way this morning, we pray that you will come forward. Let's all stand and sing.